Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions. We're going to kick off this Friday with a special selection, which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. Today's special selection comes out as from Yoru. Hey Brian, this is Sand and Stars, composed by French composer Thierry Dulurail and interpreted by brass band uh, Tres Etoiles, which translates to 13 stars, at the 2022 Swiss Brass Championship, where they placed first of the excellence category. This is the description of the piece made by the composer. Sand and Stars depicts the story of pilot writer Antoine du saint exupéry uh, flight from flight when he attempted to break the Paris Saigon record by plane. Having started well, ta this journey ended prematurely in the heart of the Sahara with a broken plane and the rescue, barely, of the pilot and his navigator. Taking place in six parts, this colorful piece varies between a mysterious climate, the deafening noise of a plane hitting the ground, and the liveliness of an Arab dance, all punctuated by cornet and euphonium solos before to end in a great musical fireworks display. Have a nice listening. All right, so let's dive into this. We have some really cool details here, and I'm excited to get into this. It's a brass band, which is like, I'm a trumpet player. It's just like, ugh, let's do it. Um, let's just jump right in. I will say, though, when I was trying to find the proper volume setting for this track, it is wildly dynamic. So the song is a bit louder than I usually put in my videos. I'll try to be quiet during the quiet parts, and that way the volume's always good on, on your end. Let's dive in. We have 20 minutes of music ahead of us. Let's see what's going on with sand and stars. Oh, you know, something interesting is it never really dawns on me that brass instruments with bigger horns would still need mutes. Those mutes are enormous. Those Harmon mutes on the trumpet, too. The double tonguing on those trumpets, man. Very stereotypical music for landing in a desert. Yeah, I've seen trombones with mutes before. I'm used to that. I don't think I've ever seen a baritone with a mute, though. That was...
interesting. Timpani player in the back is going ham. Well, it was. Bell part's really nice, keeping up with the trumpets. Descending. Yeah. The descending pitch was great in that it created the the painting of something falling and then the rising pitch of the danger impeding the ground getting closer. Very, very great decisions there. the subtle auxiliary percussion on this too. isolation of the few solo instruments from each group also works at playing up the uh, the isolation here having just crashed in the middle of a desert being alone with the, the pilot navigator by themselves A lot of people are focused on the trumpet probably, but the trombone had a neat little counter go on, uh, counterpoint going on.
really like how this is solemn, but not hopeless. The journey might have ended prematurely, but that doesn't mean the journey is over. Those cornet straight mutes are lengthy. bringing the double tonguing back but having to have the ability to do it quietly while still you know, it's, it's all muscle control dynamics between their lows and their highs it's totally different from digital swells on like a, a volume pedal for an electric guitar or something interesting listening to the composition of this where these instruments dance between melodic playing and texture playing The control, oh my jeez. Oh yeah, 
running out of water. I heard some player just hydrated a bit. That's interesting too. interesting to find this motif coming back for the third time, I think. Interesting how reminiscent this is of the first movement. symbol Danger? Victory starting to shine through. Optimism. A light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I was going to say that marimba line.
that timpani player, man. Love, oh man. This is one of those things where, uh, you know, as I'm watching it, one, I'm thoroughly entertained. Two, I'm really enjoying the music. But three, <laughs> this is one of those pieces that, that kind of set you, uh, they, they give a good understanding of where your skill level is at in a task. It's one of those things where, like, if someone isn't particularly into the, uh, the craft itself they're like yeah that was really good and like if you know what it's about you're like dude i'm never reaching that level <laughs> uh it's just one of those things that really puts in the frame you know the the wide gap between um you know the pros and like everyone else and this is the reason why they get to play the cool music and they got the chops for it they got the skills and the whole time I'm just listening to this, I'm like, I, even at my prime, would have never been able to do anything like this. Uh, part of that, you know, it's like, it's like, yes, this is like people pushing themselves. I love this and I love music crafted through that dedication on the performance I mean the, the composition we'll get to in a second too but then there's also that that tinge of pain why did I stop playing trumpet I mean I know why but like why <laughs> why did I stop ah geez I'd love to just be able to bust out some of these lines and just be like yeah yeah I got that kind of skill but that's not the path my life took. So. I think there's two things I want to touch on here. One is the performative side. What these people are having to do in order to create this music. And why this is such a showcase of skill. The other half is the composition. And why I think this is an effective song regardless of who is playing it. I want to touch on the performance first because that I think is oddly enough where my expertise lies today. Usually I'm all about the compositional side, uh, but as a, a trumpet player who understands the, the difficulty that went into this, I have a unique perspective I don't usually have when we talk about metal music. <laughs> um, first of all, we hear this one technique all over the place in the beginning we hear it in the middle we hear it at the end it's double tonguing it is utilized everywhere one of the first things you learn when you play an aerophone is that to stop sound you're going to use your tongue usually touching it to the roof of your mouth in order to stop the airflow it is actually, in a sense, bad technique to stop the airflow entirely by stopping your breathing, by stopping it around here rather than using your tongue. There are times that you can stop just, uh, uh, just to stop the, the airflow itself, but to get the really short uh, approach, you really need to, to use your tongue to really just immediately stop the note entirely. Uh, and that's why it's taught as, you know, the, the way that you need to learn how to stop notes. The problem is that people's tongue can only move so quickly. And so when we have these really, these really fast rhythmic ideas that we can't slur together. A lot of the times we're t talking about utilizing the same notes. So you can't even use the distinction between pitches in order to create a, a soft wall between these sounds. It all has to come from airflow. 
And so double tonguing is actually utilizing a t, t, a two sound, which is actually how we normally stop, our, stop and start notes using our tongue, mixed with a k, k sound in order to create an attack using just uh, some muscles back here. I actually don't know how all that works. I think about it as stopping and starting airflow rather than using the tongue, but I'm sure there's some muscular stuff back here too where it's not all air. It's certainly not all diaphragm, that's for sure. And when you mix these together, you wind up with a harsher attack and a softer one. A tu ku tu ku tu ku. They're both rather sharp. You're not. You're definitely not going to get a more legato lu 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 kind of sound here. Um, there there is a harsh stop between them, but the t the tongue sound is definitely a lot sharper than the k the k sound you're getting at the back. And as you get better and faster at this you go tuku 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 and you can create these really fast uh, runs it takes a lot of coordination and especially not just getting it but having everything equidistant and retaining that uh, rigidity of space not just alone but alongside a group of people when you're talking about movement this fast if everyone isn't precise it becomes very muddy it's the same thing when we talk about thrash metal or even black metal, the constant 16th notes. First of all, the endurance of playing it, but then also the perfection of playing it with your fellow guitarist and keeping in time, especially if you're in a more technical metal uh, subgenre where you really want that precision um, across the entire group. The same thing's happening here, except instead of two guitarists, we're talking about 15 trumpet players, or sometimes even the other 10 baritone players alongside them. We're talking about a very large amount of people all perfectly in clockwork synchronization with each other, with this difficult technique that also requires endurance. It is absolutely bonkers what they achieved here with just the double tonguing technique alone. We're talking about something that takes up maybe two cumulative minutes of this, you know, 20 minute, 19 minute song right here. And to me, that already sets such a high standard. It tells me exactly who these performers are um, and what kind of synergy they have with their fellow performers, but also the individual skills they have. Uh, right off the bat, honestly, this was one of the first things I heard, and I was like, this is a good group. This is some superior performers right here, and I don't even need to hear the other 95% of the song to know that. That's how impressive the opening of this track was for me. Now, to pair along with this, it isn't just fast tonguing that we have on this track. There's also a ton of fast runs. They are all over the place. We are often mixing this double tonguing also with quick movement. I mentioned that the double tonguing is often utilized on a single note in order to create this pedal tone against more movement, but the more movement also is these fast 16th note runs at a very up-tempo beat, and yeah, just the finger work in general is exceptionally impressive, not to mention the trombones, who are doing all of this with uh, a sliding thing. That's always sort of blown my mind. <laughs> the muscle memory. I mean, on a trumpet, if I have a relaxed embouchure and I hold the first uh, uh, the first valve, I'm hitting a B-flat under, the, uh, under the, the staff. There's just no way I'm going to miss that. The only way that I'm flat or sharp is any, uh, circumstances outside of that. Maybe the instrument's a bit cold or warm, maybe it's not tuned properly, all sorts of things. But if everything is the proper conditions, and I hold that down, and I have a loose embouchure, and I play, I'm hitting that note every time. But with the trombone, you have to know exactly where it is, because you're basically moving a giant tuning slide. all the time. You can hit all of the, the microtones. It's always blown my mind how, how precise and quick trombonists can be. Uh, we saw a lot of that on display here, but like I said also, there's the really fast fingering going on as well. 
when you look at the trumpets, the cornets, the the tubas, the the trombone, not trombone, uh, baritone players, um, and just the the precision, right? I've I've always loved playing fast things. It's just really it, it sounds impressive. It looks impressive. Your fingers are moving in a blur, and I don't know. It always sounds cool, right? <laughs> it what I'm saying is people who practice like to showcase their impressiveness, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm listening to this and I'm like, these guys are feeling really good about it. Cause again, it's the precision, it's the speed, it's the perfection. It's, it's showcasing all the hard work you put into your practice. Um, but it sounds great as well. Those sections are typically paired with other ideas, um, a layered concepts or contrasting against previous section. We'll get into some of this when we talk about the composition of the, of the piece, but, um, I mean, just again, on a technical level, what these people are showcasing is very impressive. Um, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Why did I write that? Um, I got to talk about the percussion too. I think this is really important. While a majority of what I'm impressed with is from the brass, dude... The percussion is so good too. Right there at the end, we got a, an amazing showcase of both the timpani player and the marimba player. And yeah, the part sounded amazing. The instruments are fantastic. The timpani gives the, the song in several sections its booming power. But uh, I mean, the timpani is just a really great drum anyways. It's just these really huge drum heads. They sound fantastic. You, you can't, it's just awesome. Um, we have the uh, Middle Eastern type uh, hand drums that we had in Movement 4 from the auxiliary percussionist who plays into in the center behind the cornets, uh, utilizing like six or seven different percussion instruments, uh, you know, hitting all of them, creating all these different uh, timbres and grooves. Very cool stuff there. And like I said, the marimba player at the end, just absolutely showcasing the precision of rapidly moving between all the bars. Just like this is a, a an exceptional showcase, again, of technical skill. But there's actually another side to this that is another showcase of technical skill, but in a direction I don't think is immediately noticeable if you're not uh, aware of what's going on. And that is the raw air control going on here. The, the full control over one's instrument. There was one part in here in particular, and I don't remember if I vocalized it. I remember thinking, oh my God, I can't believe they just did that. And I probably made some sort of a very impressed face. I don't know. Um, but the, the, the whole band was playing really quiet really low. It was towards the end of the song, I don't know, 13, 14 minutes in. I lost track of time. I got totally sucked into this. And so if I give you a timestamp, it's probably going to be off by a little bit. Uh, usually a bit more so than usual. Uh, but yeah, the whole band's like super quiet. And there's a trumpet solo or maybe like a trumpet duet. I don't remember. Um, and they're, they're playing these notes and it's very quiet, serene. I just have this, these trumpets and they're rising and rising in, in pitch and they end up hitting this really high note while being rather quiet and then just holding it out while the rest of the band came in around them, supporting this one note, which turns into a chord, which then eventually does swell into a larger part. We get this massive um, uh, crescendo into the next section. But I was just listening to this. I was like, there is no way I could ever have played this note as quiet as this trumpet player did. And it just blew my mind again. But see, here's the thing, right? That isn't bombastic. There isn't a flurry of fingers flying around. You can't hear any sort of technical element. But if you've played the trumpet, you know how hard it is 
to play some of those higher notes while still being quiet because it's 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 muscle it's it's embouchure it's, it's all the muscles around here in the mouth it's it's air pressure it's air control the fact that they held it out for so long there's probably some staggered breathing in there which is where you have multiple performers and this person takes a breath while they're holding a note and then jumps back on the note then this person takes a breath so it sounds like a solid tone even though people are breathing could also have been circulatory breathing i wasn't watching people to see if breaths were being taken but i mean just it was just really impressive to me and this is across the board we're talking about low tones and high tones from all sorts of instruments just really pushing the range of their instrument without having to necessarily be really quiet or really loud in any section and just again it's it's this this understanding of their craft and really i mean being near the top um just an exceptional group of musicians here and there was never a single moment where i felt that anybody was showcasing any sort of weakness or imperfection it honestly sounded really robotic to me <laughs> in a way that's that's beyond impressive for for humans um is there anything else i wanted to bring up I don't think so. Not on the performance side. So, composition. I'm going to start with one controversial idea, and then we're going to move on to some positive stuff. I do feel it drags on just a hair bit too long. And maybe that's just because there's a, a drastic imbalance, and that might be part of the story, too. The song starts off with a ton of energy. It's bombastic. It's it's victorious already. We're beginning this this massive adventure, and there's already joy and happiness and elation to it. Um, you know, the plane takes off, and there's the victory of even getting the, the wheels off the ground. Um, and uh, it might, I don't know. Maybe it's just the joy of beginning this really big thing and having no problems so early on. But the song does not take long to get into the elements of fear, of danger, of trouble ahead, and then the crash landing of the plane, which I thought was really well done. I, I mentioned during the, the track we have the descending notes, like the airplanes falling, but then the ascending notes of the rising danger, and of course the ground <laughs> coming up to meet the, the, the plane crew. Um, but then we have such a long time before we get to anything of, um, energy. And so the intensity of the song starts really high, dips down quickly and stays down for a long time until we get to the ending where the Middle Eastern dance part kicks in. This was probably about 15 or 16 minutes in um, and then that led to whatever the victory was at the end I don't I don't remember the story what was the sixth part of the oh fireworks celebration that's what it was um, very a very Disney-esque ending to this song as far as uh, chord progression and key and uh, the wrapping up of everything, the retardando towards the end of the track. We'll, we'll touch on more of that later, I think. Um, but this whole middle section, like 11 minutes, 12 minutes almost, of, yeah, rising and falling action, but all of it quieter. And it, it makes sense, right? Because I think this is, part is supposed to be uh, the long journey of waiting for help after being, you know, crash landed in, in the Sahara Desert. Is that where we were? It makes sense that it's supposed to feel this way so that when we find civilization, the Middle Eastern dance stuff, uh, and then we get rescued or whatever the ending is, that the happy ending that goes on, that's supposed to be this big moment. It's supposed to feel like we were there with them. All of this dragging and weariness and this twinkling of stars at night some of the beauty that we find despite being in this terrible situation here but we're supposed to be along the ride for them and if, if i don't know how long it took them until they were rescued but i'm sure that things 
eventually looked grim. And we do see a point in the music where um, fear of possibly never getting found ends up creeping into the music. What's sort of pensive and introspective at times turns into something ominous, dreadful. Um, and it was at this point that rounded out the end of the section before moving into the uh, Middle Eastern dance stuff towards the end. And I think that was supposed to be the point, though. They had a long, isolated journey, and we were along for that, too, so that when we got to find civilization, when we uh, found um, that we were rescued at the end of the song, we felt like we had gone on a long journey, too, but I don't know. Maybe it just takes a couple listens to get into, I suppose. Maybe I was just also put off. I listened to all of this amazing stuff at the beginning of the song, and then we spend a lot of time at triple piano with one or two instruments playing at any given time. And that's not to say that there wasn't anything of interest in here. I pointed out several solos, some really cool ornamental ideas, uh, the general rising and falling of energy. Like, there is some interesting stuff going on in here, but I just don't think it was ever interesting enough to justify the length. But again, this is like a first-time listen, and it is an incredibly dense song. So, I might feel differently after another listen. That's where I was at. I was I was definitely at a point there where I was waiting to get to the end, which, again, it put me in the same shoes as uh, the characters in, in this, uh, this tale here, this story. They were also eagerly waiting to be rescued, and they felt a great bit of relief, I'm sure, when they found civilization. And I did as well when the music finally picked up after 10 minutes. Again, though, that's like my only criticism, and as I mentioned, it could be a totally different story on another listen. Speaking of, though, dynamics. There are so many in here, and I love every single one of them. Honestly, it's it sounds kind of dumb. You're like, Brian, you love every, every dynamic element in here? I really do. I think that this composer has a fantastic ear for rising and falling energy. When it needs to be implemented, when we can remove it, when we can quickly shift between highs and lows. There were some sections in here that was swell up and I was like, okay, we're going somewhere. And then we bring it right back down just to bring it right back up, just to bring it right back down. And it never really felt out of place. It can seem very flimsy if you do that and you don't know what you're doing. But... Uh, yeah, this dude had perfect control over everything and knew when it would be appropriate, when it might seem out of place, chose not to do it then. Um, and the rising and falling is is several variants of, of uh, dynamic writing. We have volume with the all just jumping up to higher or lower sounds, but also the crescendos and decrescendos, the gradual movements. Uh, time changes all over this place. Uh, I never really checked for time's signature, but tempo was constantly in flux. There's so many tempo shifts in here. Some, again, gradual, retardandos, accelerandos, and some immediate, just changing to a tempo at a time signature, uh, at a new bar. Um, we have rhythmic dynamics all over the place. This was really impressive, listening to how uh, multiple instruments will bring in different rhythmic ideas, creating the polyrhythms amongst themselves. That's not even bringing into what the percussion is doing, which was rarely anything purely uh, like metronomic. The drums are fairly exclusively used for melodic playing in here, which makes sense. The main drums that we have here are the timpani, which are pitched. We have four different notes there. It's very easy to make melodies out of that. The only time we got something that was purely groove or rhythmic based was during the dance song when we had the hand drums back there. Um, but again, when you focus on the rhythms of them and what they're doing against the rest of the band and all the layerings of rhythms, it's just really impressive. Layering, we can't forget about that. Sometimes we just have one or two instruments, sometimes we have a couple sections, sometimes we have the whole band, and listening to them rise and fall... Um, 
the trumpets might come in for uh, a few bars and then dip out for a couple other bars while it's just the lower end, the, the tubas and, and the trombones and the baritones. And then maybe one of those will dip out and the trumpets will come back. And maybe it's tuba and trumpets now. And we have this big gap between our high instruments and our low instruments, nothing in between. And it's just all the variances of this. It is all brass, but they all carry unique elements um, and are featured in different areas of, of, of range. And allows them to, to have unique elements in the song itself. And it's just really cool to listen to the way that he pulls and removes these rolls out. So that they create different combinations of sounds. Despite all having similar brassy timbres. We also have, speaking of timbre, all of the mutes on display. We have straight mutes. Uh, we had harmon mutes. We had the cupped mutes. Uh, and again, I've never seen mutes for those baritones before, so that was pretty cool. I've seen trombone mutes, I've seen trumpet mutes. Uh, those cornet mutes, though, dang, dude, I mean, just there's a long, I don't know, man. It's, the world of, of music is wild. We made an instrument where you can play sound out of the end, and somebody else was like, I want to plug that up and still play it. <laughs> And then we had other people who were like, I'd like to plug it up in different ways. It's, uh, it's wild. Um, I'm sure there's other dynamic qualities, but I mean, you listen to that. Every bit of the song was, was wildly different, moving between these highs and lows in so many different ways. I really like the way melody is crafted here, particularly in the beginning and the end. Melody tends to not be something that is a single idea played across uh, maybe a single instrument from start to finish. It's something to be utilized as a motif, partly rhythmic, but also elements of pitch tossed in there, played in ways that are kind of borderline hocket, while also incorporating ideas of a canon or a round as well. The idea is that at least up until the two minute mark when we begin into the more introspective isolating playing where we do hear a few more solo instruments uh, like the solo trombones by the end of the song. We had a couple of uh, trumpet solos in there. We had some cornet solos. Um, but before that, main melodies were these little ostinatos, little licks or riffs that would be played by the trumpets here and then by the trombones there and then a little bit by the baritone and a little bit by the, the the tuba and sort of like a hocket and this idea gets passed around in very interesting ways but the full concept if you listen to everybody's uh, contribution to it ends up feeling like a linear melody it's just it's never given to one specific person at any one time and there tends to be multiple layers to it as it gets passed around it also gets layered up where it's not necessarily one person plays and then they stop and someone else plays it's that somebody plays and halfway through it somebody else is starting the next piece to it so there's this element here where they overlap for a moment it's very interesting to hear this type of melody eventually get developed into the lengthy single idea, single instrument uh, melody, but also because that bigger multi-instrumental motif at the beginning of the song ends up getting reutilized in various other places. I don't know how to interpret this yet. My gut tells me, though, as I mentioned early on, that uh, there's still a an adventurous vibe to this, even after the plane crashes. And my interpretation of this was that even though the initial journey ended, this journey itself is not over. And I think that that might be what the motif is designed to showcase, is that elements of the first, the journey, the adventure, uh, the feeling of doing something new is still present here. Our goals and why we're doing this and, and what we're doing might have changed, but it's still a journey, is it not? And so we're still going to utilize some elements of that in these new contexts. And I just thought that was very clever. And to continue to use that core motif, even up until like minute 14 or 15, it might have even been present in the end and I got, I, I lost it in all the, the bombastic writing towards the end of the song. 
but it's all over the place. And, and I think it's really ingenious to do that uh, because, again, while the story has changed, the adventurous element of it hasn't. I think that's all, all I have right now. I mean, I spoke like 30 minutes about this song, but there's so much more to talk about. Things that I would need specific attention to, second listens, third listens, I'm sure fifth listens, I'd still hear some new stuff to it. It's it's very impressive in every way, whether it's the big bombastic stuff or the quiet introspective stuff. It's it's intricately composed and masterfully performed on every level in every section and I'm really glad I got to listen. I have no idea how I've missed out on this, although it's... Well, this was uploaded in 2023. I don't read French, though. I don't know if this is a song from 2022 or if this was the 2022 championship. Um, yeah, uh, actually, now I'm remembering the comment that this was a championship and they took first place in uh, excellency. And uh, Yeah. You know, that's a really good Bill and Ted word for this. Uh, having finished listening to it, it was excellent. <laughs> uh, they certainly deserve every award that they got for it. Amazing stuff. Those are my thoughts. Oh, I'm not going to... I got rid of my pronunciation guide. I don't remember how to pronounce the composer's name. This is my thoughts on Sand and Stars by... Uh, Thierry, oh, I don't remember his last name, Dulu, Dulu Revel, Dulu, Dulu Rayel, dang, I think I mispronounced it the first time around too, and I definitely butchered it here, French man, I can't get my, I can't get my speaking muscles to, to do French stuff, I don't know why, it just makes no sense, you give me a Spanish name, I got it, Japanese, Chinese, I can get those. Even Russian, I tend to be okay. French, though, it's just like, I don't get it. <laughs> My mouth doesn't want to make French sounds. <laughs> That's going to be said out of context. Someone's going to meme that. Anyways, <laughs> those are my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know if you enjoyed this, if there's anything that stood out to you, anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on. Maybe you just have your own thoughts. You know, nothing about anything I said. You picked up on some stuff completely different than me. Let me know. I'm interested in all of that. Put all that down in the comments section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you to this menu right here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for this one. We do have some new music that we're going to check out next. It is some super new proggy stuff. I think it's a brand new band, actually. Some prog rock or prog metal. I don't know. The email just said, get ready for progressive music. So, I, I'm prepared for it. Are you? Uh, otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow. 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. As usual, we're going to check out a much-requested album, Vector. It's like an hour and a half long or something. It's going to be a long video, I think. And I'm going to be quite tired by the end if I remember what Vector does accurately. Until next time, though, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.